Okay, now we're going. Now we get going again. Those were long announcements, were they not? <clears throat> Let's all stand and turn to Matthew chapter 1 in the last two verses there. How many think you know the Christmas story already? It's not much you don't know about it. So that's why we're not going to just do the birth itself, but we'll mention it to go into the visit by the wise men. <clears throat> so Matthew 1 and verse 24 says, <clears throat> after Joseph received the word from uh, the Lord, it says in verse 124, Matthew, then Joseph being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, <clears throat> took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and called his name, what? Jesus. Jesus. So Lord, we thank you for Jesus. This morning that is responsible for all the churches around the world that call themselves Christian. For the millions and millions of even billions of people through the centuries that have given their life to Christ. So we thank you for this time. So help us leave here wiser than when we came in. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. Thank you, be seated. <clears throat> so now we pick up in chapter two, Matthew chapter two. And so what we'd like to call this is, what do the wise men teach us? What do the wise men teach us? Have you ever been around wise people? If you, if you don't talk as much, you'll learn something from them. I'm always liking to meet people because they might know something I don't. It can, that's, that's keep you from having dementia, you know, learning, learning, and learning, and then using what you learn. Not just, I, that's why I don't like these uh, trivia game shows. They know so much, but what do they do with what they know? I mean, what are they, what, how does that change society or better other people more than I know more than you know? And uh, what do the wise men teach us? And this is the short story of, about the wise men. <clears throat> They're called the wise men three in our music, are they not? But it doesn't say there's three of them. So we see a few verses here. In verse 2, I mean, excuse me, chapter 2, verse 1. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, the days of Herod the king, behold, there came how many? How many? It, it doesn't, men is plural, John. It doesn't say. So we have a lot of folklore and tradition for the last 2,000 years, so... A lot of time we think we know so much and it's not even in the Bible. So there's wise men come from the east to Jerusalem saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? Now, instead of reading the rest of this, we're going to take it piece by piece for sake of time this morning. Because from chapter one, where we stopped in verse 25 to chapter two, Something has happened. Two years have gone by. Okay, from the end of chapter 1 to the beginning of chapter 2. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. So we're going to see at least six things here that the wise men can teach us today. <clears throat> so we have... Uh, Look at verse 1 and 2a, the first part of 2. First, we can say that they teach us to be willing to travel for Christ. They teach us that we should be willing to go where God's going. Amen. Amen. And it says here, saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? Uh, excuse me, we read verse 1, that's what I want to say, and then 2a saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? We have seen his star in the east 
And so we see that they've moved from somewhere. Where do you think they came from anyway? Just down the block? These are important people. They're called magi. That's the root word for magician or wise man. And uh, so these are not con artists. Uh, there's a, a magic show comes on once a week. Pen and Teller fool us. I have magicians come and do tricks to try to fool them. But I, I listened the other day and he said, now uh, you fooled us with that trick. And then uh, they, they don't realize what they're saying. And now uh, that trick was a good trick. Well, that's not who these people are. These are not trick, trick, tricksters. These are magi. These are very wise people. These are highly educated, highly knowledgeable, and they know astronomy as well. So where is the king of the Jews, it says here? <clears throat> so they've traveled, some say as little as 600 miles one way, or as much as 900 miles maximum from Persia, or today it, it is Iran, and, or beyond that. So these people are wise, and they only came because their wisdom has revealed the scriptures to them that far away. Well, how do they know about that? Have you ever heard of Babylon, the Babylonian Empire, <clears throat> when they, the Jews were under them before Jesus was born? under that rule before Rome took over the world uh, government. So they teach us to be willing to travel for Christ. I mean, it's amazing. <clears throat> Why isn't our church full and the rest of the church is full? Because even professing Christians refuse to travel to church. They refuse, they'll go to the mall and they'll go to their relatives and they'll go great distances, but not for Jesus Christ. And they're, they're, and they're claimed to be Christians. And they won't even walk across the street to give a gospel tract or say, hey, I'd like you to come to church at our church. So they teach us we must be willing to travel <clears throat> for Christ and go where God is going. We need to be going where God's going. Secondly, look at 2B. We left off there. So they not only teach us to be willing to travel, but they also teach us to treasure Christ. Once we find him, that he is to be the focal point of our entire life, our entire life. 2B reads like this. <clears throat> For we have uh, come, starting in the east, and what? And are come to do what? We're not coming here to see him and get his autograph or take a picture and a selfie. Uh, we're here to treasure this king, this king. Of the, how many like to be saved? You like being, how many really th think it's nice to have eternal life? Yeah. That's a treasure, isn't it? Look over at 2 Corinthians. It talks about this treasure of Christ that we have. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 7, it, it tells us that this is the treasure chest that Jesus gave us, and it is Christ himself. <clears throat> so we have 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 7. I want you to read it with me aloud, if you would. 2 Corinthians 4, 7, here we go. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We did not earn this, we did not deserve this, but yet we have this treasure and the excellency, it all goes, the glory goes to Jesus Christ. Yeah. And we, we need to treasure, that's what we talk about. We need a revival. Why? To bring us back to square one. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's why we always need the primitive gospel, not the popular gospel. Yeah. <clears throat> the popular gospel does not treasure Jesus alone. If we didn't have any Christian music, and Christian meals and Christian fellowship, all we had was our salvation. Do you think that'd be enough for you? Popular Christianity, that's not enough. They've got to have big, what everything but Christ. As long as I feel good about it, as long as I have friends and I have money, uh, thank you, Jesus. But what about Jesus himself? 
What about the blood of the Lord Jesus? Quickly look at Philippians 1.21. <clears throat> this is how Paul put the treasure of salvation. So these wise men teach us to be willing to travel for Christ anywhere God's going. And secondly, they teach us to treasure Christ, <clears throat> the King of the Jews. So Paul says in 121 of Philippians, while in jail, so he doesn't have much else but Jesus, does he? I mean, what's he got in the cell? D did he have a Christmas tree? There? <laughs> they didn't have the word. But here's what he said. This is his whole life wrapped up in one sentence. Read this with me. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And I've said many, many times, people misquote this. They'll say, for to me is Christ and to die is gain. It's, it's two twos in there. See that? T-O, to me to live, to me to live, to me to live. And some people say, for to, to me to live is money, job. For to me to live is a great family for to me to live. Now what does it take? It takes Christ only. That is the treasure of salvation is Jesus himself. For to me to even live is Christ and to die gets better and better. Is gain, it says there. Well let's go back to Matthew. So they teach us to be willing to travel for Christ like they did. And they teach, and now these are uh, Gentile kings, possibly. How many think they might be Gentiles? Because Isaiah is full of the Gentiles when the Messiah comes, God's servant comes. That they will better. How many Gentiles are here today? 100%. I mean, if anybody should treasure salvation, it ought to be us. Aren't you glad that God gave us the responsibility to spread the gospel and not the Jews only? I don't know why they are fighting and killing each other, the Ishmaelites and the, uh, and the Jews, because who was the father of the Ishmaelites? Abraham. Who was the father of the Jews? Isaac. Well, guess, guess what? Abraham, where did he come from? Ur of the Chaldees or Iraq. He was taken out of the Gentile world and made an example to show people what God does with one man and one family and one doctrine. It's almost uh, 12 minutes to 12. See, Israel is not the clock. Israel is the hands on the clock. How in the world does one little Gentile man called now a witness, a Jew, a Hebrew, comes from the family of Eber, that's where Hebrew comes from. I mean, here we're talking 4,000 years ago, and they're the number one newscast every single day. How does that happen? Only God could do that. Because the Bible said it, and it happened, and it's happening before our very eyes. Jesus Christ is our treasure. Now, thirdly, let's pick up in verse 3 to verse 8. So they teach us to be willing to travel, and they teach us to treasure Christ. These wise men teach us also to be willing to tell others about Christ. We're to talk, we're to teach, and we're to reach the rest of the world at any cost. So here we have the uh, trickster, the, the demonic man, Herod. So when Herod the king had heard Matthew 2, 3, when he heard these things, they said, where is he? Where is the king of the Jews? It was troubled. Somebody want to find out what's on the other side of that? Just step out there. Don't let anybody in. It's been an interesting day, hasn't it? 
When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. How many know people that are troubled cause trouble? They're upset, so they want you to be upset. That's the kind of a jerk we're dealing with. And all Israel, Jerusalem with him, and when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them, not, he didn't request, he demanded, that's the kind of people these folks are, you know, some of them are your friends, hopefully that's not you or me. He demanded of them where Christ should be born. They said unto him, and <clears throat> now, <clears throat> what are they getting ready to do? They're getting ready to teach this Jewish king what he should already know. But they're going to tell him, they're going to teach him, they're going to influence him, but it won't do any good. They said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. Now he's going to Micah Reeves. How are you? They're going to the book of Micah here. 5 verse 2. It is written 700 years before it happened. Are we okay? Okay. So 700 years earlier it was said this is exactly where the Messiah be born. They said unto Herod in the Bethlehem of Judea for thus it is written by the prophet and quotes Micah 5 2, Thou Bethlehem in the land of Judah art not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. So they gave him the lowdown on the king of the Jews, Jesus Christ. So they're trying to fill in the blanks for this ignorant, wicked man. <clears throat> then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, privately met with them, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to <clears throat> Bethlehem. He sent them to, and go and search diligently for the young child, not the the baby, but the young child. <clears throat> and when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. Is he lying or what? Herod, what a liar this guy is. But what we see here, these wise men are teaching us to be willing to tell others about Christ at any cost. Now, do you think that they would have ever gotten back to their homeland if Jesus had killed the baby or killed the little child. I think I don't know if they'd have ever made it back to their country because of this man is so treacherous. <clears throat> How many know there's something wrong with people that will kill little babies? That's why abortion is the issue. It will never go away. It will never be normalized to kill babies just because I don't want a baby. That's the only reason. I, I just don't want one. So let's give it away, adopt it. No, let's 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 kill it. I mean what kind what what kind of heart heartless person does that? Well ignorant people do that and people that follow the popular crowd do that. But decent people don't just kill little innocent animals or kid or people they just don't do it well herod would have done that and he did do that we'll see so they teach us to be willing to tell others about christ even at peril of our own life quickly look at acts 4 uh, 18 because if they hadn't done that in the book of acts we wouldn't be sitting here today now acts chapter 4 verse 18 they teach us to be willing to tell others about christ Acts 4, 18 to 20. And it says here, there, the government has stopped the preaching of the gospel in the book of Acts. And the apostles turned and talked to tell them. And they called them, the apostles, and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. Suppose our government did that here in Springfield, Missouri. It said, you can talk about anything except Jesus Christ. What will we do? You're not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, 
whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye, read 20 with me, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Amen, amen. It is worth going to jail or the gallows if we have to do that. It's called martyrs. Remember, martyrs never blush, they always bleed. We should not stop witnessing because we're embarrassed. We must just keep on going, even if it means we bleed. Number four out of six things here. Now go back to verse two, Matthew chapter two, verse two. So we see here we're to travel, we're to treasure Christ, we're to tell others about Christ. Now Matthew chapter two and verse two, fourthly we see here, uh, these wise men teach us to always stay on target. Stay on target, don't be distracted with the world. Look what they say here, chapter two. Where's uh, the king of the Jews? And then he goes on for we have seen his what? We, we have a marker, we have a target. We have, we're a goal. We're following this, we're not gonna deviate for hundreds and hundreds of miles. We're going to follow this star where it takes us. Uh, so they're, they've zeroed in priority one. We have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Now, look at uh, verse nine and 10. We see he's mentioned again. When they had heard the king Herod, they departed and lo, the what? The star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. Now, why is a star important? Uh, while you're turning to Numbers 24, 1,500 years before these men showed up, it was already said that a star would be the focal point. Who's the, uh, you know, they have a, a movie and a play called Jesus Christ something. Superstar. Well, he, he is. I mean, we don't look at him as a rock and roll hero. We look at him as there's nobody, there's nothing better to focus on than Jesus Christ. He is the focal point of all the history is about Jesus Christ, you know, his story. It all goes back. Our biblical worldview is a, a Christ worldview. And we shouldn't lose that, that focus on Jesus Christ. While you turn to the 24th chapter of Numbers, now these wise men, doesn't say how many there are, but they traveled a long time, so they had to be a pretty good sized caravan of wealthy individuals. They're going to see a king, and they quite possibly are. In one uh, study I was looking at, they were actually naming some Persian uh, kings of that time and that era. They actually have names for who they think some of these men might have been during that time period. It is a historical fact. Now, they've, they're coming from, they feel like the Babylonian school of astrology, which is today we call astronomy. Astrology today is nothing more than superstition. How many Libras are here today? Any got any Virgos or uh, whatever those other fable names are? That's astrology today. But back then, astrology was astronomy. So they studied the heavens, and even if you'll study about what was a star, there's a Virgo, a virgin, there, and so all the constellations are constantly moving, and they're watching the constellations moving, and they're following the movement of the constellations, and there's a bright star, they, some suppose it might have been Jupiter, and another star I can't name, but these are historical facts of astrology or astronomy. These are very, very well schooled from the school of Babylon called the astrology school. <clears throat> Jesus is always the star of the show. 
Now, Numbers chapter 24, real quick. How many remember the false prophet Balaam in this story? He was not a Jewish prophet. He was a liar. He was a false prophet. And King Balak wanted to hire him to put a hocus pocus curse on the Jews in the wilderness. And he was going to do that for money. But God visited him and said, you're not going to do that to my people. I will tell you what to say. And this is what he said. God, in a trance, he tells us God put him in a trance and he spoke this to Balak, the wicked king. And uh, he's telling us about the star, Jesus Christ coming to defeat those kind of people. Now look at verse 5, 24, 15. This is 1,500 years before the star of Bethlehem. And he took up his parable, Balaam, and said, Balaam, he's speaking of himself, Balaam, the son of Beor, has said, the man whose eyes are open has said. So he's talking about God has opened his mind, his knowledge. He has said, which heard the words of God and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty, falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. So he is in a mystical state of mind, and God is totally in charge of this man's mind and mouth. And here it is. I shall see him, but not now, meaning the Messiah. I shall behold him, but not nigh, not right now. There shall come a blank, Capital S, there should come a star out of Jacob and a scepter, a ruler. That's what the scepter is about. A ruler, a scepter shall rise out of Israel and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Sheth. And uh, I think we've stopped there. No, verse 18. And Edom shall be a possession. Seir also shall be a possession of his for his enemies, and Israel, what? Shall do valiantly, and we're watching that today on television with the war of the Arabs and the Jews. We're watching, who's winning the war in Gaza? Who's winning the war in Lebanon? Who's winning the war of all these nations of the ancient names of what we're dealing with today? Who's winning the war? The little couple of, Four million Jews. How does that happen? The Bible said it would happen. That's why it's happening. I believe the old Bible. Amen. Every comma and every jot and every tittle. Amen. <clears throat> we, we need to cherish the word of God. Amen. We're living in the greatest of times and the worst of times. But God's people are in charge. Hands on the clock tell us how close it is before Jesus comes back the second time. So they teach us to always stay on target. Follow God's leadership. Now Balaam is a liar, but guess what? Truth can come from liars. How many know a lot of ex-convicts know a lot of Bible? And they'll come out and use the Bible to, to con people giving them money and, and stuff. And, but guess what? The truth is still the truth no matter how... Pre Do we not have some liars on TV talking about Jesus? Yeah. They're making money off of it, but the, the truth is still going out from liars. And I wish they weren't all liars, but we have quite... Jesus said be more... That'd be a sign of the times that there will be false Christ everywhere. Number five out of six. Let's look quickly. <clears throat> so they show us we should travel for Christ and treasure Christ and tell others about Christ. <clears throat> Teach us to always stay on target as we seek Christ. Don't be distracted by this popular world. Number five. Look at verse 11b. <clears throat> Going back to Matthew 2 verse 11. 
They teach us also to support Christ's work with our treasures. He's given us his treasure. And now we see the picture of the gifts. That's why they say three, because it's what gold, frank, <clears throat> frankincense, and myrrh. All right, that's why they say three. So we see in verse 11 here, <clears throat> and uh, we'll pick up 11b, second part. And when they had opened their, what is it? They opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And that's a great study on its own. <clears throat> the marvelous gift of gold, gold. If you just do a scientific breakdown of gold, it's amazing what gold does. And then frankincense, these, these spices and herbs and myrrh, embalming things from, from life to death. It all represents a full life of, of a human, what we need as we, as we go through our life. So we support Christ's work with our treasures. We're not to support the work of God with hay, wood, or stubble. That's giving our worst, right? Our leftovers. Uh, there's such a thing as a tither. You ever heard of a tither? Well, it should be all of us, right? But some people that are Christians or tippers, they never tithe. They just give a tip. A little penance here, a little bit there. They give as little as they can get by with. The Bible teaches 10%. They would like to at least just only be obligated to nine, maybe five. I saw a cartoon one time that says, welcome to our church. And it says, the, the home of the 2% tithe. <laughs> Trying to fill the building. Well, isn't that the way? How many of these mega churches, 3,000 people maybe this morning in a church, how many tithers do you reckon are in that church? They give their treasures. No, they keep their treasures. They give leftovers or they give nothing. They think, well, I had to, I had to spend $10 on gas to get here. I don't, I don't think I need to give any more. What a cheapskate. I think that person needs a dose of salvation, probably. Change their mind. Now, it was hard coming out of sin and giving anything to the church because we were so far in debt, as most young people are today. But God wouldn't leave us alone about it. You know why? Because he wanted to bless us. He didn't want to hurt us. He wanted to use us. He gave us the treasure of salvation. He gave everything to us so we could give just a little bit back to him so others could be saved. It really does bother me when pastors are making into the millions of dollars a year. That might be Old Testament doctrine, but it's not New Testament doctrine. Because the more he gives us, the more we can do for him and others. So they teach us to support Christ's work with our treasures. We're to give our gold, silver, and our precious gemstones uh, is what they did there. So our best, we give our best time to God, our best talents, we give our best treasures, and we give our best testimony for Jesus Christ. So others can see there's a difference in a born-again Christian. We can set that example, and God will give us his best if we give him our best. We don't want hay, wood, and stubble in our offerings plate, do we? We want something that has a value to reach. A soul is valuable. One soul is very valuable, more than worth more than what's in any offering plate. Now, number six, and lastly, so we've seen we're to travel, we're to treasure our Christ, we're to tell others about him, we're to stay on target, not be distracted, no matter what and also to support the work of Christ with our treasures and our life. Number six, look at verse 12. <clears throat> they teach us also to be in touch with the person of Christ. Always be walking with the Lord. Always know what God's will is in our life. 
It's a little verse here in verse 12. So they found Jesus Christ, the young child, and they've done all they can do. Now, what are they supposed to do? They're supposed to go back to Herod and tell him where to find Jesus so Herod can worship him. Huh? You know, so he can murder him and his family and maybe those guys too, the witnesses. But here's where God shows up. Being warned of God, how? In a dream. When all else fails, God just may use a dream. How many know that? Because he can get our full attention, can he? He can get our full attention. Being warned of God in a dream, that they should not return to Herod. They departed into their own country another way. So God spared their life. So they teach us to always be in touch with the person of Christ. I imagine they were pretty shocked when uh, it doesn't say one of them had a dream. They had a dream being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod. They, 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 they. So this is evidently a collective thing. You know what I dreamed last night? You ain't gonna believe what I dreamed. Well, uh, well, I had the same dream. I guess we better one plus one plus one plus three. I think we, I think we ought to do what the dream said. They had a no doubt they had a walk with God of some sort they might not have fully even understood. How many think they believed that that was the Messiah? How many think they had any little bit of doubt that this is not the right thing? They, they accomplished what they set out to do. And God wasn't going to let that fail so we could be here this morning teaching this story. So... They teach us to always be in touch with the person of Christ. Be super sensitive to his Holy Spirit and his leadership at all times. Look at uh, verse 16 to 19. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked, these, these people didn't set out to mock Herod. They just set out to obey God. People think we're mocking them. Oh, you Christians think you're something. Well, no, we just think we're followers of Christ. People think that we're against them. I mean, here we are, probably the most honest people on earth, and they think we're the biggest crooks that ever walked the earth. That's, that's the, men, the, the mental problem they had. He saw that they was mocked to the wise men, <clears throat> was exceeding wroth, angry man, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof, from two years old, that's why we think Jesus was at least two, two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah, or Jeremy here, the prophet saying, <clears throat> you'll find this, Jeremiah 31, verse 15, 700 years earlier. And it quotes in Ramah, verse 18, 2, 18 of Matthew. In Ramah there was a voice heard lamentation and weeping in great mourning. Now this is a prophecy 700 years before this slaughter. If you don't believe the Bible, well, you'll have to figure that one out. There was great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children would not be comforted because they are not. Now, I like just one sentence in verse 19, the first one, two, three, four, five words. Read it with me. But when Herod was dead, that was stop there. Isn't that good? Where do you think Herod is? I, I would almost say he's 100% went to hell. Hating God that much. Hating Jesus that much. So we must be super sensitive. Rome, lastly, look at Romans 12, 12. We must constantly be in touch with God so that we can live this wonderful life that he's given us, undistracted, on target, very sensitive to spiritual things. 
must be super sensitive to his spirit and his leadership. And Romans 12, uh, 12 here says it like this. Rejoicing in hope, this is how we are to live, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, what else? Continuing instant in prayer. And then after that, it goes on and shows you how to treat others after that, distributing to, to the saints and so forth. But we're to live like 12, rejoicing in hope. Are we rejoicing? Patient in tribulation. Well, that's a tough one. But here's one, instant in, in prayer. You know, I was, I was saddened. I went to meet somebody in the Walmart parking lot the other day. And uh, I have, I, I've been around here a long time, but I've never seen so many homeless people. It's drizzly, cold, and every corner had shopping carts and people's possessions. And they're standing there with signs, uh, you know, every corner. It's against the law of Springfield to do that, but things are so desperate right now. They, on every corner, and it was overwhelming because the traffic was heavy on Friday, uh, people getting off work and clogging up that intersection over here, uh, the interstate. And I, I just pulled over in Walmart's parking lot and I just almost started weeping. How can you, how can you help? How can you change? How can, Everybody there will more, more likely lie to you on falling on hard times. And his wife is out there shivering. And, and I didn't see any kids. That's good. Now, I was just overwhelmed. I pulled in the parking lot. And uh, you know what I did? I didn't turn the radio on. I just turned the car off and I just started praying. That's what you got. You got to have a walk with God. Now, Lord... Should I target that family? Should I get involved with that? Should I get involved with that? Because if you have the gift of helps, some people, that's one of their gifts. They always want to help. <clears throat> There's some that don't want to help anybody. They have another gift. I think it's called selfishness. Anybody have that gift? <laughs> Probably not. You wouldn't be in church today. But that's what you have to do. And, I, and I'm used to doing that, just pulling off the road and sit there quietly and start talking to the Lord. And Lord, give me some, uh, give me some direction. How many get chaos and confusion runs through your head? So much stuff going on. Well, don't try to figure it out. Pull off the road and start, just talk to God about it. Be sensitive to spiritual things, not physical things, not financial things. <clears throat> I wrote me a note. Take the time it takes to be right with God. <coughs> Say it again, okay. Take the time it takes to be right with God. We don't want, I mean, when you don't have a leadership of God, you're on your own. Anything bad, nothing good can happen. But anything bad. When I was a young Christian, I was listening to a tape and I've never forgot this, and I've said it many times. If you want to listen. If I please God, are you listening? If I please God, what does it matter if I displease men? If I please God, whom then does it matter that I displease? But if I displease God, whom then does it matter that I please? Either we please God or we please man. You can't please both of them. One or the other. So if I please God, then what does it matter if I displease men? But if I displease God, what does it matter if I please men? And that's why a lot of Christians have an upside down life. They don't do any of these things. We just, these guys set the example. I wrote me another note. What did the wise men teach us? They taught us how to live a New Testament life for Jesus Christ is what you see here. This is the Christian life. These guys represented from a heathen world. How many know that? Did you see it? I always like to read through the Bible, finding another story. Is there another story in here? Is another truth here. The, where's the gold under the dirt? 
And these truths here, this is the Christian life that these guys had taught us how to live. To treasure Christ and use our treasures to serve Christ. So Lord, we thank you for this, what we call Christmas Eve. We thank you for Jesus and the treasure of salvation. We do pray for our disintegrating country and neighborhoods. It's all because of rejection of Jesus Christ. Thank you for changing us when we got saved and getting us off the streets and out of, out of, out of hell. We thank you for the great life we've had for many years as Christian followers and leaders. Save that poor soul or many souls through our broadcast today also. And use us to preach thy word no matter what it costs us. And thank you for the example of these wise men. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Let's all stand and turn to page number 299. Let's stand 299.